Hi, everybody. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Lennon. Uh, I'm going to start right away because this might be kind of long. I didn't time it. I have a lot to say. <laughs> On the subject of interior, uh, describing interiors, uh, this talk is called How to Describe a Room. And this is more, a little more scripted than the talks I usually give, so I, I'll sort of awkwardly read off of a piece of paper um, instead of wildly gesticulating and making it up as I go along. In other words, I'm actually being pro for once in my life. Uh, the ostensible aim of this talk is to provide you with ideas for describing interior space in, uh, mostly this is fiction uh, um, aimed, but I hope the poets will have some, uh, get some use out of it as well. Uh, a room isn't merely a convenient vessel for your plot to unfold in. It's a means for developing character, an opportunity to establish the style and tone of your writing, and a powerful metaphor for a number of important things. I'll talk generally about a r what a room is and what it's supposed to do, and then I'll read some examples of well-described rooms and how they function in the novels and stories where they appear. So the first half of the talk will be more nuts and boltsy, and the, the second half will be more example-y. Uh, but first, let me back up a little. If I'm going to talk about how to describe a room, I've got to talk about why to describe a room. And if I'm going to do that, I should talk about why you should describe anything, a person, a place, an object. What is the point of physical description in fiction? How, in fact, does it enhance our understanding of story? Let me start with a popular example. Most of you probably know. And by the way, I, we, if the fiction talks, we seem to enjoy the guess the, guess the excerpt game. So I have... I have get, most of these are, are like tr truncated excerpts of what I'm going to read, um, and uh, uh, you know I'll do the thing where you, after I read it, you can shout out, you can prove that you are extremely erudite by saying, "I, why well, clearly that's, you know, that's Good Night Moon." <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'll start with an example. Most of you probably know. A man and a woman sit at a cafe, talking around the abortion that the man wants the woman to have. The hills in the distance, as described by the woman, evoke the shape her body will soon have if she allows her pregnancy to continue. They offer a visual clue to the somewhat cryptic dialogue that makes up the bulk of the story. And in fact, there's only one primarily descriptive paragraph in the entire story, and this is it. The hills across the valley of Ebro were long and white. On this side, there was no shade and no trees, and the station was between two lines of rails in the sun. Close against the side of the station, there was the warm shadow of the building and the curtain made of strings of bamboo beads hung across the open door into the bar to keep out flies. The American and the girl with him sat at a table in the shade outside the building. It was very hot, and the express from Barcelona would come in 40 minutes. It stopped at this junction for two minutes and went to Madrid. Of course, this is Hemingway. Thank you. Hemingway's story, Hills Like White Elephants, and that is the most description the story is going to offer us. We get the hills, which are long and white. The station is just described as the station. It doesn't say anything except the station. He's depending on you to figure out, you know, to know what that is and to make one in your head. Uh, it consists of rails and a building. There's a bead curtain, a table, an American, and a girl. Later we'll see some clouds, a river, and a field. We'll see their bags, which are covered with stickers, and we'll see some other people at the station, quote, waiting reasonably for the train. Unquote. A few of these things are described beyond the noun that identifies them. At most, we'll get an adjective or adverb, long, white, reasonably. Save for the woman's hat, we don't see anyone's clothes. We don't see anyone's hairstyle or eye color. We don't hear the busy sounds of the train station or the cry of birds. We don't smell engine oil, or rather, we do, because we are making these things up in our heads. Hemingway has given us only the barest visual essentials. And in the same way that we feel compelled to see shapes in the random patterns stars make in the sky, we fill in the details that he has left out based upon the ones he has included. This approach works well for this story because it's a very simple story about a single point of contention between two people. In the broad continuum of narrative complexity, this story registers almost as a still life. It has exactly one guiding metaphor, the White Hills, and unlike the story's other details, they come up several times demanding our attention. Now the question is, should you write like Hemingway? Maybe you should, or maybe on the other hand, you should write like this. I drew close behind a green truck going about five miles an hour slower than I was. It was technically a garbage truck, but not the kind of city machine that comes to mind when you hear that phrase, the drooping rear section, like the hairnet of a food service worker. It was instead the larger kind of truck that hauls the compressed garbage from some central processing site to a landfill, a big rectangular container drawn by a semi-detached cab. 
I know that the garbage was somehow compressed because I could see little pieces of it pressing fiercely out of the slight gap under the rear panel. It was not refuse of a normal fluffy just gathered density. The thick green canvas covers, very dirty, were drawn across the top of the container, secured with bungee lines that stretched in angles down its sides. The angles of the bungee lines and the transition between those straight lines and the taut scalp curves they pulled from the cloth covers were what pleased me first. Then I looked between the bungee lines at the surface of the metal container. Organic shapes of rust had been painted over with more green, and the rust, still active, had continued to grow under its new coat so that there was a combination of the freshness of recent paint and the hidden weatheredness of rust. The whole thing looked crisply beautiful as I changed lanes to pass it. Anyone? I've quoted from, was that, was that a hand? No, I've quoted from this book before. It's Nicholson Baker's book, The Mezzanine, um, which uh, takes place in the duration between when a guy gets on an escalator at the bottom and gets off at the top. And it's all the things he's thinking about, the details of ordinary life. It's sort of a, a portrait of the physical, American physical landscape of the 1980s. And um, anyway, uh, I've quoted, yes, I just said all these things off the top of my head, and here they are written for me to repeat to you. Um, all right. This book is not simply filled with detail, it's about detail. It attempts to evoke the unfathomable complexity of each small moment, as experienced by a man with a perversely egalitarian appreciation for the fabric of everyday life, the kind of person who passes a garbage truck on the road and finds it crisply beautiful. Hemingway and Baker are using the physical world in very different ways. Hemingway hastily sketches a physical world in which his spoken drama is to be staged, leaving room for us to notice one significant prop. Baker's drama is internal. His protagonist is concerned with exploring the minutest strands of memory to see how they intersect, how they add up to a life. The way you describe anything, then, is going to depend on what you're trying to do and whom you have employed as the agent of your work. But how is a room different from any other describable story element? In his book, The Poetics of Space, Gaston Bachelard ludicrously elaborates on the intimacy and metaphorical importance of houses. The house, he writes, is one of the greatest powers of integration for the thoughts, memories, and dreams of mankind. Without it, man would be a dispersed being. The house shelters daydreaming. The house protects the dreamer. The house allows one to dream in peace." Unquote. Most of us are born in a room, and most of us will die in one. We make rooms because we require shelter from the elements, but also in order to protect our tender minds from the terrifying emptiness of open space and the paralyzing infinitude of things we can do. We make rooms for specific purposes. They are practical and cognitive spaces designed for particular tasks. Want to cook some food? Go to the kitchen. Need a shower? The bathroom's your spot. Things getting hot and heavy on the sofa? Let's go to the bedroom. <laughs> Our houses are instruments of civilization and upon reflection are surprisingly rigid in design. Imagine visiting someone's house for the first time and discovering that they have a toilet installed in their kitchen or a stove in the bedroom. These wouldn't merely register as odd quirks. You'd regard them as signs of mental illness. So, sorry if you actually have a stove in your bedroom. Um, because our houses reflect the state of our minds, and our minds take on the shape of our houses. When we remember some forgotten detail of our lives, we speak of doors opening, rooms being unlocked, when our emotions are jumbled and confused, we attempt to compartmentalize. And when we dream, we often dream of houses that have changed, forgotten rooms, impossible architectures, awkward intersections of the social, emotional, and spatial. And so a room is a powerful thing, and in fiction, a useful tool. So here's the thesis statement of my talk. In fiction, a room is the story of how a particular person inhabits space. That is to say, a fictional room is a story, and a fictional room reveals character. Let's concentrate on the first part of that first. When we enter a room, we don't necessarily receive the details of that room all at once and with equal weight. Let's say I walk into my kitchen intending to make a sandwich. I open the bread drawer and it's empty. But I just bought some bread yesterday. Did someone else in my household move it or eat it? I turn around and find it there on the counter, but there's also something spilled there, a bottle of wine. The culprit, a cat, is sitting in the sink, lapping at a half-empty china creamer left over from the morning coffee with a guest. I reach for a dish rag to clean up the wine, and in so doing, notice that the flowers in their vase are wilted. I dump out the vase, alarming the cat, who scurries past the stove. I suddenly realize I left burning from breakfast this morning. Now, this may tell you something about the state of my household, but it also illustrates, I know it was so corny. Um, 
That's what I'm all about. It also illustrates the cause and effect to figure into how we see a room, especially one we already know well. It can be useful in your writing to think of a room not as a list of objects that need to be checked off, but a series of events. The eye travels around a room, lingering on different things. What the eye sees determines what it will see next. In addition, take note of which details I provided for you in the paragraph I just read, and which, equally importantly, I didn't. I told you that my cat was sitting in the sink, drinking cream. I didn't tell you that he was a mackerel tabby, named Eno, or that the creamer was a chip plastic, or a chipped orange piece of thrift shop fiesta ware. I didn't tell you that the spilled wine was a 2011 Pinot Noir, or that the dish rag was navy blue terry cloth with white embroidered cross hatching, or that the flowers were pink lilies, or that my house is a Greek revival in upstate New York with pitted wooden floors. These things are true, and might have made the scene more detailed, but for the purpose of my telling, I didn't need you to linger in my kitchen for very long. I wanted to illustrate a point about cause and effect. So I gave you the cause and effect and left out the minutia. Your skill as listeners, however, probably enabled you to picture my kitchen in vivid detail. Indeed, the real details I just provided are likely, unless you've been in my house and hung out with my cat, to have contradicted the ones you generated yourself in your head. It may even have annoyed you to hear them. This all may be annoying you. <laughs> um, so that's good news for my writing. It would mean that I offer the right detail in the right amount. Because the story, as I think I've said in this room before, is not, is a, not a tyrannical medium, it's participatory. We may all have the same text before us, but we're holding different stories in our heads. A good story depends upon the participation of its reader and offers its reader pleasurable opportunities for invention. But what about the room as a character development opportunity? Let's revisit that scene. Let's say I've just returned from a camping trip during which a bear stole and ate all my provisions. When I enter that kitchen, I am extraordinarily hungry. Once I find the bread, I'm not even going to see the wine, cat, or flowers. My reader is going to get an earful about the texture and scent of the peanut butter I spread on the, bed, the bread, the glistening strawberry preserves, and the flavors of all three as I cram them into my mouth. The roasty, salty flakiness of the bread crust with its notes of almond and rosemary. The cloying sweetness of the jam, offset by the oleaginous, salty granularity of the peanut butter, etc. Only after I'm finished eating will I suddenly absorb the fact of my messy kitchen. Or let's say I've just suffered some terrible emotional blow. Maybe my wife has left me. Perhaps I'd arrive in the kitchen by rote, intending to eat, but ennui and misery overtake me, and I end up leaning over the sink, crying for 10 minutes. Every detail of the sink would accompany my miserable thoughts. The half-empty coffee cup she left behind with traces of her lipstick on the rim, the, rusted, the crusted remains of the last meal we shared before she packed her bags, the single surviving wine glass from the set of 12 we received as a wedding gift, which I now must wash in order to get drunk. But the cat, the cat who has been staring at me in alarm from the sink has knocked over the Pinot Noir. You get the idea. How we see room depends upon who we are and what we're going through at the time we enter it. And we might apprehend a room in an order with one detail leading to the next. And that order, again, will depend upon character. In addition, the language, and this is very nuts and bolty, and uh, Lily and Lubaba will have heard this riff before. Um, the language we use to describe a room will help determine the level and variety of attention our readers give to it. If you want the object in your room to stand out, try to give it grammatical agency. Let it be the subject of the sentence that is about it. For instance, instead of saying, there was a lamp on the table, or there was a picture on the wall, consider saying, a lamp stood on the table, a picture hung on the wall. You don't need the to be verb to bring the object into existence. Similarly, it's easy to overuse looking and seeing verbs. She looked at the table and saw a lamp standing there. She noticed a picture hanging on the wall. These constructions are useful when you want to foreground the act of seeing, to imply active observation. But often it is preferable to let your narrator recede into the shadows and allow what she sees to take center stage. This mirrors the cognitive experience of entering the room. The self falls away briefly as we apprehend our new surroundings. OK, let me turn to a few examples of well-described rooms. And thanks to um, Greg and Virginia and Amber for suggesting some of these, They're reminding me they existed. Um, first, an excerpt from a comedy about a troubled would-be writer from London who intends to finish his book while apartment sitting for his oldest friend, a successful and obsessive compulsive composer. The composer friend, Oscar, has given the writer very specific instructions for the care of his two cats and, most importantly, his extremely expensive custom-installed wooden floors. Here is part of the opening chapter. The flat was in the corner of its building, and the room I entered occupied the corner of the flat. Two more south-facing windows continued the, uh, continued the ranks started in the main area, and the western wall had one as well, so the light that articulated every corner and dust mote, 
Even the dust motes look neat, their flight paths as checked and regulated as the red eye from Tehran coming to Lax. Frosted the surface of the grand piano so that the black lacquer was dental advert white. Unlike the kitchen, this room had an aura of useful industry. One wall was filled with shelves, and those were stacked with a regimented clutter of box files, CDs, vinyl, cassette tapes, racks of sheet music, frame certificates, more photographs, citations, degrees, honors, and awards. A life abridged. Under the nearer of the two south-facing windows was a writing desk with its leather cornered blotter, pots of pens and pencils, and two stacks of paper, one plain, one rule for musical notation. Next to the desk was a stack hi-fi that looked like the product of an abandoned Scandinavian space program. Stewing in London, I often fantasized about the ideal setting for creativity, and it always looked much like the room I now stood in. The place seemed impregnated with Oscar's talent and productivity. It would be perfect. I could imagine short stories, plays, perhaps even the start of a novel here. Clamped to the left-hand edge of the desk was one of those turn-handle pencil sharpeners that I associated with school. Directly underneath this sharpener was a steel bin. I peered into the bin and was rewarded with the sight of shocking laps, some pencil shavings, and a discarded tram timetable. Rubbish. Debris, even. Just casually left there for anyone to see. Oscar was plainly slipping. As if on cue, prompted by the timetable, a tram rumbled past in the street below. Hadn't Oscar written a piece called Variations on T Tram Timetables? Pleased with my memory, I wandered over the piano, flipping open the lid. This action caused a slip of paper to waft out and describe a swooping arabesque descent to the floor. I scooped it up and read it. Oscar had written on it in a prickly, pointy, fussy hand, please do not play with the piano. Has anyone read it? Yeah, it's Care of Wooden Floors by Will Wilde, who I'd never, I just discovered this online. Um, and he's got a new book coming out this, uh, this year. Uh, it's, re it's really funny, and I recommend it. Um, as the novel goes on, the writer finds more and more of these little directives from Oscar, which he invariably violates, and his mistakes multiply until he's essentially at war with Oscar, resolving old conflicts using the apartment as a weapon. Take note of the way Wiles shows us both the narrator's admiration for his friend, that this place seemed impregnated with Oscar's talent and productivity, and his resentment, shocking lapse, his sarcasm and flip humor intensify as the drama increases. Okay, uh, next is a very dark 1950s novel from the point of view of a strange girl living under the influence of her psychopathic father. I entered the house. It was my home, and it smelt of animals, though there was lino on the floor. In the brown hall, my mother was standing, and she looked at me with her sad eyes half covered by their heavy lids, but did not speak. She just stood there. Her bones were small and her shoulders sloped. Her teeth were not straight either, so if she had been a dog, my father would have destroyed her. I said, Mother, I smell cabbage. It must be lunchtime. She looked scared and scuttled toward the kitchen, holding up her little hands like kittens' paws. I went into the dining room, intending to lay the table, but Mother had seen before me, or been before me, and although the silver was quite bright, there were brown gravy marks on the tablecloth. Even when I arranged salt cellars over them, they were not covered. There were pickles of various colors and jars. The water in the glass jug looked stale, but there was beer for my father. The dining room was dark because a dirty holly tree came close to the window. You could not have told it was summer except that the fire grate was filled with pleated paper with soot on it. Before the fireplace was a rug made from a skinned Great Dane dog, and on the carved mantelpiece there was a monkey's skull with a double set of teeth, which seemed to chatter when you looked at them. I asked Mother if I could walk in the park with my friend Lucy. As usual, she told me to go ask Father, so I went to the surgery. The door was propped open by a horse's hoof without a horse joined to it. And I looked through. He was sewing in a peak's eye. He used chloroform, but I went away because I couldn't bear to see him sewing a dog like that. The smell of chloroform seemed to go with me, even when I met my friend. Jeffrey. That is a good guess, uh, and you got the tone right, for sure, but that's not it. Anybody know this? This, um, this is uh, The Vet's Daughter by Barbara Commons, C-O-M-Y-N-S. Um, so take note of the descriptions of the mother's demeanor. She's silent like an animal and is compared to a dog and a cat. Later we see the father performing surgery on an anesthetized dog. The house is dirty, and we see from the table setting that the father gets beer while the women of the house get filthy water. Animal parts are everywhere, further blurring the line between the human and animal worlds. The summer can't get into the house, but the narrator takes the smell of chloroform with her when she leaves. Um, 
And this book uh, is, is germane to, uh, um, wait, which of you was talking about magical realism? I can't remember who it was. Is it Brian? Greg. Oh, it was Greg, okay. Yep. Uh, the, this this uh, novel has a, one of the most interesting endings that I've ever read in a novel. It's incredibly peculiar, but exactly perfect. So I, I highly recommend it. Um, up next is part of a science fiction novel. Um, the protagonist, who goes by the name Control, has been hired to oversee a mysterious and terrifying place called Area X. The public has been told the area is the site of an environmental disaster, but it has really been colonized by some strange life form. Many expeditions have been lost there, and Control is determined to discover the cause, though he's beginning to see that his mission is futile. The first item on his agenda was the long-awaited viewing of the videotape taken by the first expedition. Those video fragments existed in a special viewing room in an area of the building adjacent to the quarters for expedition members, a massive white console set against the far wall in that cramped space. It jutted more sharply at the top than the bottom and mimicked the embracing shape of the Southern Reach building. Within that console, dull gray head recessed inside a severe cubist cowl, a television had been embedded that provided access to the video and nothing else. The television was an older model, dating back to the time of the first expedition, with its bulky hindquarters recessed into an alcove in the wall. Control's back still retained the groaning memory of a similar ungainly weight as a college student struggling to get a TV into his dorm room. The low black marble desk with glints of formica stood in front of the television, old-fashioned buttons and joysticks allowing for manipulation of the video content, almost like an antiquated museum exhibit or one of those quarter-fed seance machines at the carnival. A phalanx of four black leather conference chairs had been tucked in under the desk, cramped quarters with the chairs pulled out, although the ceiling extended a good 20 feet above him. That should have alleviated his slight sense of claustrophobia, but it only reinforced it with some minor vertigo, given the slant of the console. The vents above him, he noticed, were filthy with dust. A sharp car dashboard smell warred with a rusty mold smell. The names of 24 of the 25 members of the first expedition had been etched on large gold labels affixed to the side walls. Authority. Hmm? Authority. Authority by Jeff Vandermeer. You've been reading these? Uh, yeah, this is a trilogy of science fiction novels. The first one came out last year. This one came out last month, and the third is coming out in the fall uh, by, by Jeff Vandermeer. They're really good. I, I recommend them. Okay, um, though this book takes place in a near future or alternate present, take note of the way he keeps uh, way the past keeps intruding. The memory of a college dorm room, old-fashioned controls, the antiquated museum exhibit, the creepy memorial to the lost ex uh, expedition members. The video console is huge and juts out over Control. Similarly, Control's personal story is mired in the past, a mysterious and powerful mother, a terrible professional mistake that has led to someone's death. The past looms over him in the room as it does in his life. Okay, here are three excerpts from a novel about a woman slowly losing control of her house, family, and mind. Uh, no, I, I cut them down to two. I think there's just two. Um, but I think a lot of you will have read this. They're uh, in chronological order, the way they appear in the book. I remember Sylvie walking through the house with a scarf tied around her hair, carrying a broom. Yet, this was the time that leaves began to gather in the corners. There were leaves that had been through the winter, some of them worn to a net of veins. There were scraps of paper among them, crisp and strained from their mingling in the cold brown liquors of decay and regeneration, and on those scraps there were sometimes words. Thus finally did our house become attuned to the orchard and to the particularities of weather, even in the first days of Sylvia's housekeeping. She emptied several cupboards and left them open to air, and once she washed half the kitchen ceiling and a door, half kitchen ceiling and a door, Sylvie believed in stern solvents, and most of all in air. It was for the sake of air that she opened doors and windows, though it was probably forgetfulness that she left them open. It was for the sake of air that on one early splendid day she wrestled my grandmother's plum-colored Davenport into the front yard, where it remained until it weathered pink. Okay, here's... Okay, I actually, I'm going to read all three. Lucille, this is a little later, Lucille stood up and pulled the chain of the overhead light. They never turn on the overhead light. This is like the first time ever. The window went black, and the cluttered kitchen leaped, so it seemed, into being, as remote from what had gone before as this world from the primal darkness. We saw that we ate from plates that came in detergent boxes, and we drank from jelly glasses. 
Lucille had startled us all, flooding the room so suddenly with light, exposing heaps of pots and dishes, the two cupboard doors which had come unhinged and were propped against the boxes of china. The tables and chairs and cupboards had been painted a rich white, layer on layer, year after year, but now the last layer had ripened to the yellow of turning cream. Everywhere the paint was chipped and marred. A great shadow of soot loomed up the wall and across the ceiling above the stove, and the stovepipe and the cupboard tops were thickly felted with dust. Most dispiriting, perhaps, was the curtain on Lucille's side of the table, which had been half consumed by fire once, when a birthday cake had been set too close to it. Sylvia had beaten out the flames with a back issue of good housekeeping, but she had never replaced the curtain. And finally, the parlor was full of the newspapers and magazines Sylvia brought home. They were stacked pretty neatly, considering that some of them had been rolled, perhaps to swat flies. Nevertheless, they took up the end of the room where the fireplace had been. Then there were the cans stacked along the wall opposite the couch. Like the newspapers, they were stacked to the ceiling. The kitchen was stacked with cans and with brown paper bags. Sylvie knew that such collecting invited mice, so she brought home a yellow cat with half an ear and a bulging belly, and it littered twice. The first litter was old enough already to prey on the swallows that had begun to nest on the second floor. That was good and useful, but the cats often brought the birds into the parlor and left wings and feet and heads lying about, even on the couch. Yes, of course. It's Marilyn Robinson's housekeeping. Um, I, d I, ha I had forgotten that incredibly corny detail that, she's, that she put out the birthday cake fire with an issue of good housekeeping. <laughs> Very funny. Um, so the girl's Aunt Sylvie already has trouble completing tasks when she first moves in and doesn't recognize boundaries. Doors hang open, leaves fly in, cleaning goes unfinished. The more time passes, the more the natural world overtakes the house and more chaos comes to reign. Eventually, Sylvie will disappear into the wilderness. Uh, this next one is a haunted house story. A love scene in the kitchen turns into something else entirely. The stove didn't shudder as it adjusted to its heat. Denver wasn't stirring in the next room. The pulse of red light hadn't come back, and Paul D. had not trembled since 1856 and then for 83 days in a row. Locked up and chained down, his hands shook so bad he couldn't smoke or even scratch properly. Now he was trembling again, but in the legs this time. It took him a while to realize that his legs were not shaking because of worry, but because the floorboards were, and the grinding, shoving floor was only part of it. The house itself was pitching. Seth slid down to the floor and struggled to get back into her dress, while down on all fours, as though she were holding her house down on the ground, Denver burst from the keeping room, terror in her eyes, a vague smile on her lips. God damn it, hush up, Paul D. was shouting, falling, reaching for anchor. Leave the place alone. Get the hell out. A table rushed toward him and he grabbed its leg. Somehow he managed to stand at an angle and, holding the table by two legs, he bashed it about, wrecking everything, screaming back at the screaming house. You want to fight? Come on. God damn it, she got enough without you. She got enough. The quaking slowed to an occasional lurch, but Paul D. did not stop whipping the table around until everything was rock quiet. Sweating and breathing hard, he leaned against the wall in the space the sideboard left. Seth was still crouched next to the stove, clutching her salvaged shoes to her chest. The three of them, Seth, Denver, and Paul D., breathed to the same beat like one tired person. Another breathing was just as tired. Yes, Jeffrey, that is beloved by Toni Morrison. And it is about a family, of course, haunted by the ghosts of its past. Uh, the first line of the story is 124 was spiteful, and that refers to the house where the where the characters live, it has been possessed by the malevolent spirit of a dead child, victim of a mercy killing made necessary by the horrors of slavery. The ghost doesn't want the family to love again. Morrison uses the language of slavery to describe these former slaves' efforts to beat back the past, holding her house down on the ground, whipping the table around. Sexuality and violence were mingled during the slave era. The house won't let Seth and Paul D. pry them apart. All right, this next one is rather long, uh, but this is the this book is the reason I wrote this talk, so I'm gonna I'm gonna force you to uh, to listen. Uh, it's from a novel about a man who suffered a personality altering head injury in a mysterious accident and has won a massive out of court settlement, which he isn't sure what to do with. In this scene, he's at a party at a friend's apartment, and I have more here than you have on the sheet. I was heading down the hallway, back toward the main room, when I noticed a small room set off the circuit I'd been following up to now. I'd moved around the kitchen each time in a clockwise direction, and round the main room in an anti-clockwise one. Door, sofa, window, door. With the short, narrow corridor between the two rooms, my circuit had the pattern of an eight. 
This extra room seemed to have just popped up beside it, like the half had in my settlement. Offset and extra. I stuck my head inside. It was a bathroom. I stepped in and locked the door behind me. Then it happened. The event that, the accident aside, was the most significant event of my whole life. It happened like this. I was standing in the bathroom with the door locked behind me. I'd used the toilet and was washing my hands in the sink, looking away from the mirror above it, because I don't like mirrors, generally, at this crack that ran down the wall. David Simpson, or perhaps the last owner, had stripped the walls, so there was only plaster on them, plus some daubs of different types of paint where David had been experimenting to see how the room would look in various colors. I was standing by the sink looking at this crack in the plaster when I had a sudden sense of deja vu. The sense of deja vu was very strong. I'd been in a space like this before, a place just like this, looking at the crack, a crack that had jutted and meandered in the same way as the one beside the mirror. There had been that same crack, and a bathtub also, and a window directly above the taps like there was in this room, only the window had been slightly bigger, and the taps older, different. Out of the window there had been roofs with cats on them, red roofs, black cats. It had been high up, much higher than I was now, the fifth or sixth or maybe even seventh floor of an old tenement-style building, a large block. People had been packed into the building, neighbors beneath me and around me and on the floor above. The smell of liver cooking in a pan had been wafting to me from the floor below, the sound, too, of spit and sizzle. I remembered it all, but I couldn't remember where I'd been in this place, this flat, this bathroom, or when. At first I thought I was remembering a flat in Paris, not the one I'd stayed in when I did my course. That hadn't looked anything like the one unfolding in my memory, inside or outside. There had been no cats on roofs, no liver, and no piano music. No similar bathroom with an identical crack on the wall. But perhaps someone else's, Catherine's, or someone we'd both known, another student. But we hadn't visited any of the other students' places. No, it wasn't Paris. I searched further back in my past, right back to when I'd been a child. No use. I couldn't place this memory at all. And yet, it was growing, minute by minute, as I stood there in the bathroom, this remembered building spreading outwards from the crack. The neighbor who'd cooked liver on the floor below me had been an old woman. I'd passed her on the stairs most days. I had a memory of passing her outside her flat's door as she placed her rubbish on the landing. She'd say something to me, I'd say something back, and then carry on past her. She'd been putting out her rubbish for the concierge to pick up. The building that I was remembering had had a concierge, just like Parisian apartment buildings have. The staircase had had iron banisters and worn marble or fake marble floors with patterns in them. I remembered what it had been like to walk across them, how my shoes had sounded on their surface, what the banisters had felt like to the touch. I remembered how it had felt inside my apartment, moving through it from the bathroom with the crack on its wall to the kitchen and living room, the way plants hanging in baskets from the ceiling had rustled as I'd passed them, how I'd turned half sideways as I'd passed the kitchen unit's waist-high edge, turned sideways and then deftly back again in one continuous movement, letting my shirt brush the woodwork. I remembered how all this had felt. Most of all, I remembered this, that inside this remembered building, in the rooms and on the staircase, in the lobby and the large courtyard between it and the building facing with the red roofs with black cats on them, that in these spaces, all my movements had been fluent and unforced. Not awkward, acquired, secondhand, but natural. Opening my fridge's door, lighting a cigarette, even lifting a carrot to my mouth, these gestures had been seamless, perfect. I'd merged with them, run through them, and let them run through me until there'd been no space between us. They'd been real. I'd been real. Been without first understanding how to try to be. Cut out the detour. I remembered this with all the force of an epiphany, a revelation. Right then, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my money. Yeah, it's this remainder. Everyone from my book group in Ithaca is like, oh, it's oh, Tom Cody's remainder. Of course I knew that one. Everyone does. No, um, yeah, this, this is a 2005 novel um, that I uh, utterly adore. Uh, its protagonist is striving to recover his identity, not his name or his place in the world, but his actual self through repetition, reenactment, and memory. And in it, interiors always refer to other interiors. We see the narrator run through memories over and over in his mind, and then in the real world, as he builds elaborate sets and hires actors so that he can experience his memories again and again. The novel employs many reoccurring words, phrases, and motifs, like he, you, you may have noticed that in that excerpt, and ultimately takes the form of a closed loop, like the one he is walking at at the beginning of that scene. Okay, the next one is uh, from a novel about a famous pianist who is scheduled to play a concert in an unnamed European city. It employs a dreamlike narrative logic. Its interiors are fluid, collapsing time and space. 
and reflect the pianist's troubled memories of his broken family and artistic self-doubt. Here he has been led to a practice space where he is to prepare for his recital. I entered a long, narrow room with a gray stone floor. The walls were covered to the ceiling with white tiles. I had the impression that there was a row of sinks to my left, but I was by this point so anxious to get to the piano, I paid little attention to such details. It's almost like a writing exercise. Uh, my gaze, in any case, had been immediately drawn to the wooden cubicles on my right. There were three of these, painted in an unpleasant frog green color, standing side by side. The doors to the two outer cubicles were closed, but the central cubicle, which looked to have slightly broader dimensions, had its door ajar, and I could see inside it a piano, the lid left open to display the keys. Without further ado, I attempted to make my way inside, only to find this a frustratingly difficult task. The door, which swung inwards into the cubicle, was prevented from opening fully by the piano itself. And in order to get inside and close the door again, I was obliged to squeeze myself tightly into a corner and to tug the edge of the door slowly past my chest. Eventually, I succeeded in closing and locking the door, then managed, again with some difficulty in the cramped conditions, to pull the stool out from under the piano. Once I had seated myself, however, I felt reasonably comfortable, and when I ran my fingers up and down the keys, I discovered that for all its discolored notes and scratched outer body, the piano possessed a mellow, sensitive tone and had been perfectly tuned. I was just preparing to embark on those explosive opening chords when I felt something hard tap against the back of my shoulder. Turning, I saw with dismay that the door of the cubicle had somehow come unlocked and was hanging open. I clambered to a standing position and pushed the door closed. I then noticed the latch mechanism was dangling upside down on the door frame. After further examination and with a little ingenuity, I managed to fix the latch back in place, but even as I locked the door once more, I could see I had effected only the most temporary of solutions. The latch was liable to slip down again at any moment. I could be in the middle of asbestos and fiber, in the midst, say, of one of the highly intense passages in the third movement, and the door could easily swing open again, exposing me to whoever happened by then to be wandering about outside my cubicle. And certainly, if some obtuse person, not realizing I was inside, were to attempt to gain entry, the lock would not offer even nominal resistance. All these thoughts ran through my head as I seated myself back on the stool, but after a little while, I came to the conclusion that if I did not make full use of this opportunity to practice, I might never get another. And if the conditions were less than ideal, the piano itself was perfectly adequate. With some determination, I willed myself to stop worrying about the faulty door behind me and to prepare myself once more for the opening bars of the Mullery. Then, just as my fingers were poised over the keys, I heard a noise, a small creaking sound such as might be made by a shoe or some piece of clothing somewhere alarmingly close by. I spun round on my stool. Only then did I notice that although the door had stayed closed, the whole of its upper section was missing, so that it more or less resembled a stable door. I had been so preoccupied with the faulty latch, I had somehow completely failed to register this glaring fact. I now saw how the door ended at a rough edge just above waist height. Whether the upper section had been torn off as a result of wanton vandalism, or because some renovation was taking place, I could not be sure. In any case, even from my seated position, I could, by craning my neck slightly, gain a clear view of the white tiles and sinks outside. I could not believe Hoffman had had the effrontery to offer me such conditions. To be sure, no one else had come into the room so far, but it was perfectly conceivable a group of six or seven hotel staff could come in at any moment and begin using the sinks. The situation seemed to me untenable, and I was about to abandon the cubicle angrily when I caught sight of a rag hanging from a nail on the door, the doorpost, close to the upper hinge. I stared at this for a second, and then spotted another nail on the other doorpost at exactly the same height. Immediately guessing the purpose of the rag and nails, I rose to my feet again to examine them further. The rag turned out to be an old bath towel. When I opened it out and hung it across the two nails, I found it formed a perfectly good curtain over the missing section of the door. I sat down again, feeling much better, and prepared myself once more for the opening bars. Then, just as I was about to start playing, I was yet again stopped by the creaking noise. Then I heard it once more, and I realized it was coming from the cubicle on my left. It now dawned on me, not only that someone had been in the next cubicle the whole time, but that the sound insulation between the cubicles was virtually non-existent, and that I had remained unaware of the person until this point, only because, for whatever reason, he had remained very still. Furious, I arose again and pulled at the door, causing the latch to come loose again and the towel to fall to the ground. As I squeezed my way out, the man in the next cubicle, perhaps seeing no further reason to restrain himself, cleared his throat noisily. I hurried out of the room, feeling thoroughly disgusted. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's Ishiguro's The Unconsoled. 
Um, and this in this novel, the well, maybe I wrote this here. Well, I'll say what I say here, and then I'll add to it. Uh, here, Ishiguro is using the pianist's surroundings to foreground his personal defects, his quickness to anger and offense, his fear of exposure and humiliation, his tendency to get hung up on details, and his feelings of imprisonment and discomfort, not only with his immediate physical environment, but with his own body and mind. And the book operates with, this, with a bizarre logic where spaces connect in unexpected ways whenever the plot or his internal plot needs something to exist or whether he is sort of thwarting himself in, in the interior, things just spring into existence to do that thing in the physical world. And, uh, you know, there are bits where he, there's a bit where he's in a cafe with his, with his son, I think, and then he's asked to come talk to some guy at a restaurant and they get in a car and they drive miles into another town and then they go into this restaurant and then after they have a conversation, they lead him through a passageway in the back of the restaurant through the kitchen that opens into the cafe that he just left, where his son is still sitting. It, it, it just it makes no sense whatsoever. But these, these dreamlike spaces are, you know, he never, um, he never directly addresses his emotional state. But the, the landscape and the interiors, especially, um, are doing that work for you and for the writer. All right, this is the, I'll do one more of these. And um, thanks to Amber for reminding me about, about this awesome book. Um, yes, it could begin this way, right here, just like that, in a rather slow and ponderous way, in this neutral place that belongs to all and to none, where people pass by almost without seeing each other, where the life of the building regularly and distantly resounds. What happens behind the flat's heavy doors can most often be perceived only through those fragmented echoes, those splinters, remnants, shadows, those first moves or incidents or accidents that happen in what are called the common areas, soft little sounds damped by the red woolen carpet, embryos of communal life which never go further than the landing. The inhabitants of a single building live a few inches from each other. They're separated by a mere partition wall, and they share the same spaces repeated along each corridor, they perform the same movements at the same times, turning on a tap, flushing the water closet, switching on a light, laying the table, a few dozen simultaneous existences repeated from story to story, from building to building, from street to street. They entrench themselves in their domestic dwelling space, since that is what it's called, and they would prefer nothing to emerge from it. But the little that they do let out, the dog on a lead, the child off to fetch the bread, someone brought back, someone sent away, comes out by way of the landing. For all that passes, passes by the stairs, and all that comes, comes by the stairs. Letters, announcements of births, marriages and deaths, furniture brought in or taken out by removers, the doctor called in an emergency, the traveler returning from a long voyage. It's because of that that the staircase remains an anonymous, cold, and almost hostile place. In old buildings, there used to be stone steps, wrought iron handrails, sculptures, lamp holders, sometimes a bench to allow old folk to rest between floors. In modern buildings, there are lifts with walls covered in what would be obscene, covered in uh, would be obscene graffiti and so-called emergency staircases in unrendered concrete, dirty and echoing. In this block of flats, where there is an old lift almost always out of order, the staircase is an old-fashioned place of questionable cleanliness, which declines in terms of middle-class respectability as it rises from floor to floor. Two thicknesses of carpet as far as the third floor, thereafter only one, and none at all for the two attic floors. Yes, it will begin here, between the third and fourth story at 11 Rue Simon Crubier. All right, Jeffrey, yes? Life, a user's manual. It's George Perret's Life, a User's Manual in, uh, in translation. Um, this is a 1978 book. It takes place in a large Parisian apartment building, and in it, a rich man named Bartle Booth uh, has embarked upon a project to create 500 watercolor paintings and have them made into puzzles, which he will then solve and glue back together, and then erase the paintings with detergent. This obsessively self-negating effort affects the lives of the building's other inhabitants, whom we learn about through the book's strange narrative structure, a series of descriptions of the building's every room frozen in an instant of time, June 23, 1975, just before 8 p.m., moments after the rich man's death. The omniscient narrator gives us stories about the people who have lived or are living there and how they're all connected to each other and to the rich man. And there are all kinds, of, if, you've, uh, if you've read this book, if you know, uh, talked about Ulipo in my talks here before, he, he does all these little Ulipian 
uh, organizing tactics. It, there is like the whole book is stru structured according to chess moves, and it's, it's almost like he's he's looking at um, the 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 building with the facade torn off, and there's a grid of apartments, and each uh, each room has a chapter, and you see in that moment what is happening in that in each room. Um, so that's all I've got. Uh, all right, not bad. Uh, do you want to talk for ten minutes? Shall we have a conversation about interiors? Elmer. Yeah. Yeah, and Lucille, the sister, you know, they're, they're two children, and they're being taken care of by their aunt, and the aunt, aunt is crazy. And the narrator and the sister make different choices in this book about who, what side to take. Are they going to go crazy with their aunt, or are they going to enter the, the civilized world? And Lucille is the one who begins to uh, uh, betray the family and have a, wants to have a regular life. And so she's the one who turns on the light and makes them see the way they live, you know. Um, I did... Uh, um, one of my early novels, The Funnies, is about uh, a guy who, uh, who, it's about, uh, who takes over his father's cartoon strip. And the cartoon strip is like the family circus, which is just like a one-panel thing with like hammy um, family humor, kind of. And all the characters are based on the re real-life brothers and sisters who are highly dysfunctional. So there's a reason I'm talking about my own work now. Um, but there's this bit where the, the, while he's learning to draw the comic strip, he realizes that the father, when he drew it, he just would make an interior based on what he needed at that moment, right? So if he needed the, a picture to be hanging on the wall, he just made a wall. If he needed someone to put something on a table, there was a table. And so uh, there, was a, there was a TV special made about the family that, that used all these crazy interiors, and he got, he, the narrator gets stoned and watches it and then draws a map of the house. And of course, it's like, different iterations of the house superimposed on each other. It's like some crazy tesseract of, of imaginary interior. Because, I, because I, I love this notion that like interiors and fiction are, are highly opportunistic. You only put them, you, like you said, you only put them there when you need them. And the result is that they have an interesting unreality or a, you know, a, a, a different reality from what you get in the real house. So. Yes, Jeffrey. Um, regarding Beloved, yeah. And this actually ends up with the whole house as sort of a, instead of just one room as a, something to involve. That actually is the address of the house from 24 Bluestone Road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of my favorite first lines of any novel ever because it's so cryptic, you know. Um, but it's it's packed with meaning that only becomes clear. It's very simple, and you have no idea what it means, and um, you it, you know only becomes clear as the as the plot continues. I never noticed the missing three though. That's really good. Um, more. The. Yeah. How much of how much of I think it's I think it's ma massively uh, connected to character, you know. But the, Virginia's referring to a book I'm writing about. Um, uh, there's a, a murder in the first chapter. You witness a murder in the house, um, and then ten years go by, and you see what happens in the house over those ten years as people as it's now empty, and you know, vagrants move in and then move out, and animals occupy it and the windows get broken and then someone tries to renovate it and they run out of money and 
then it gets dilapidated again, and then someone finally buys it, fixes it up, and you see this all just as you're standing there in a very detached, free of character way. Um, and then, uh, then people, at the end of the first chapter, a new family moves in. And of course, they're going to inadvertently bring back the ghosts of the, of the past. So I, I, in this book, I'm, I'm starting with this dry description of the house. And I'm, I'm frankly just ripping it off from the middle chapter of To the Lighthouse, where, you know, where, the, um, where they're at the, you know, it's where the war is going on. So they're not at the vacation house. And you see, you know, you start to see um, uh, vines climbing in the windows, you know, and it's, there's, the house is empty and it has no character because there's no one there. And when the people come back, they've been changed by the, by the war. So, um, so that's kind of what this is about. You, you get a, you get a, unbiased view of the house but when people arrive suddenly they begin to they begin to characterize the house and each of them has a different way of seeing it like the the uh there's a bit where the 12 year old daughter of this couple decides that the house is it's awkward and she decides it's a nerd so for the rest of the book she calls it nerd house you know and but uh the father is never in the house he's always in the studio at back working on his sculptures because he is domestically absent uh, and uh, you know, I actually have to do more with the mother now that I, now that I think about it. Thanks for the note. Um, other thing, Sarah. Do you feel like there are certain rooms in the house that don't get talked about? The mud room? I don't. I don't know. That's a that's a good question. Does um, rooms in the house that don't that don't get talked about? So has anyone played this video game called The Stanley Parable? Okay, so The Stanley Parable is this game where you, it's a first person game where you, you wake up, you spawn in, a, in an office and there's a computer and everything looks like you can interact with the objects and you're, you know, you're like mashing the button, the space bar, like trying to pick up stuff or do stuff, but everything is inert and you just wander around this completely empty office and you just can't do anything and what happens is you just die over and over and then a narrator presents you with one every time you come back there's a new storyline and the the joke is there's no way to win the game uh you just have to die the key is finding all the ways to die and you get shown all kinds of crazy ironic um self-referential video game jokes basically it's in, in the narrative it is inc it's incredibly fun and um, one of my graduate students recommended it to me because I, I'm always talking about like different narrative lines. So, um, so there's, but there's this, th there is, so you're desperate for interactable objects in this game and you think you can't be totally inert. You, you have to be able to do something. And finally, you're walking on, all the doors look the same. They're just plain gray doors with a number on them and none of the doorknobs will open. Like they do, no they do nothing. When you hit the thing, you hear this little click, like click, 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 and you can't open them. So finally, you, in this one version of this one uh, iteration, you pass a door that says broom closet. And you're like, I'm going to try it. And, and it opens. And then you're in, a, and there's shells, and there's like a wrench sitting there, and there's, some, there's a hammer, and you start trying to grab everything. And the narrator is saying to you, don't, don't, don't do that. There's nothing for you to do in here. It's just the broom closet, thing, you know? <laughs> And, but you're like, no, I know there's something in here. And you keep messing around, and the narrator says, can we move on? You know, can we, it's, you know, why are you so obsessed with this broom closet? You know, but this, this idea that, uh, um, I don't even know why, why I got on that. But, the, but like the, what's that? Yeah, yeah, so, but the, one of them, is, I thought the broom closet, right? And this, in this game, it's like casting the broom closet as, the important room. It's also saying, ha, it's saying to you, the broom closet's the important room. But of course it's not. There's nothing, there's nothing about it. There's nothing in it that you can do, but you figure there's a secret there, you know? And I, I, it reminded me a little bit of The Unconsoled because um, it's, uh, the game itself is manipulating space, you know? And it's manipulating it to, to fuck with you, basically. Um, and that's exactly what the narrator is doing to himself in The Unconsoled. He's, He's like creating this environment to, to thwart himself, to keep himself away from seeing and, and thinking about the things that are important. So maybe one more quickie. Daniel? Um, after thinking about the other things that I mentioned, um, I think that the first thing that comes to mind is that there's a lot of things that are not the
Yeah, yeah this is the uh, Margaret Atwood, right? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, that's that's astute. It's definitely worth worth reading. It's a good interior space book to be sure. Um, I don't have anything to add to it though. No, I mean I just think that you like that concept of making space for the art and the Oh yeah, definitely. And you know, when I think about it, I think there's spaces in all of our houses where they get ignored because they represent something we don't want to deal with. Sometimes it's an actual thing. Like, you know, we have, we have this, this storeroom in our house that needs to be cleaned out, but I don't, I don't want to do it because I don't want to see all the stuff. Like, I know what stuff is out there. I just don't want to deal with it because that part of my life is over now. But meanwhile, we don't have a, a room. And, you know, Rian and I walk past there like, we really got to clean out that storeroom. It's like, yeah, maybe we'll do it this weekend. Yeah, let's do that. And then it's like, we just drink a couple of bottles of wine and forget about it, basically. <laughs> yeah. Because we're never going to do it. That's where the mice live. All right, we, uh, we should go to class. Thanks a lot, you guys. And